Yep. Okay. Welcome to the Nova project update. My name is Matt Riedemann. I work for Huawei. And I'm the Nova PTL for the Pike release. This is Dan Smith, works for Red Hat, Nova Core. Jay Pipes for Mirantis, also Nova Core. So what does Nova do? Nova is the compute service. I assume most people here know what Nova is. Um, hypervisors, running VMs. Nova was founded in the Austin release. Besides Swift, it was the other first project, I guess, in OpenStack. In the Okada release, there were 233 contributors uh, submitting patches. I would be interested to see if, uh, with a raise of hands, who contributed a patch in Okada. All right, thank you. Um, latest user survey adoption numbers say that I think Keystone was the other very high one. It's 98% of clouds in production are using Nova. I also thought I would share the, uh, uh, some of the other stuff from the latest user survey. We were given the opportunity to ask a question to respondents, and the one that we picked for Nova was, how important is it to be able to customize Nova in your deployment? And this is pretty varied, so things would be like your own network manager, um, compute manager, quota driver, uh, there's hooks. Can you, are you using a lot of hooks? Are you plugging in API extensions? So the majority is that it's not all that important that most deployments are using stock Nova with maybe some bug fix patches or something just while it's waiting to get upstream. Um, a smaller number, but still somewhat substantial is, uh, it's somewhat important, and these are for things that we sort of expect, like people putting in their own scheduler filters, and those are things that we support. Um, and then the very small 10% was I heavily customize it. I do a lot of patching and replacing of maybe core components. This was another interesting one that I wanted to call out. There was a question. This is a, uh, apparently compared to the 2016 April survey, how many cells are people using in deployments? And so the majority, it says, is um, not using any. But there, the thing that stuck out to me was there was this big jump from the 2016 survey. And I'm, I've actually asked the foundation about, do people actually, when, they're pe when people are answering this question, do they know what they're, what they're responding to? Because I interpret this as cells v1. Traditionally, cells v1 is, when you talk about cells in Nova, it's cells v1, the thing that was added in Grizzly. And some large deployments like CERN and Rackspace and GoDaddy are using. But traditionally, we've always said upstream, the development community has said, if you're getting started with Nova, don't be using cells v1, because there's a lot of issues and just things that don't work in the API. So I don't know if people are thinking that this is regions or if one cell means that I've just got my single deployment. But really, what I, how I would interpret this is, are you running the Nova cells service? It's an optional service. So if you're running that thing, then you're running cells v1. Um, so I'm going to try to work to, with the foundation to get a um, little bit of clarity and for future surveys actually sort of defining some of these things. Because cells v2 is a thing now. But it's required in Okada, and most deployments aren't anywhere near Okada yet. So people are just starting to roll up to Newton. So we read that as probably 19%. The, are people using actual cells? People. Yeah. Um, so I was going to go over a little bit of, of the Okada highlights, since that's, that's the last released thing. Um, and here's the release notes at the top. If anybody's interested in finding release notes, I was going to let Jay talk about some of the placement service features. Sure. So right, uh, in Okada, we now have the placement service uh, required for scheduling. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, the, uh, the placement service is a, a, a very simple, thin uh, REST API service that's useful for storing inventory and, and allocation information. Um, we introduced it in Mitaka? Newton. Newton, yeah. Newton OK. Um, and we've slowly been sort of more integrating more and more of it into, into Nova. Um, the 
the big thing in Okada is that the, the scheduler is now calling out to the placement service to help it make decisions about where a particular uh, launch request will, will end up. So we're going to continue uh, adding more and more integration pieces uh, between Nova and the placement service in, in Pike and beyond. So. Another big thing with Sales V2 and Okada, so Dan will talk about that. <clears throat> so we've been working towards getting this uh, more integrated, newer uh, cells arrangement baked into the core of Nova for a while. And so Okada was the first release where everybody has a record for um, being a cell, even if they've only got one cell. So previously, if you had cells v1, you had a bunch of extra services that you were running and your deployment looked quite different. As of Okada, um, everybody is starting to have all of the things in their deployment that will be attributes of a cells, a multi-cell or a single cell deployment, which gets everybody unified on uh, the same set of code and has records in the database uh, describing their cells, even if that's only one, and gives us a, an upgrade path to being able to split out cells in the future from a deployment without having to re-architect. Um, so everybody is configured that way in Okada. You can't actually create a second cell. I mean, you can, but it won't work. Um, but it's a major... Um, milestone in the journey towards getting everybody um, to that point. And because of that, there are several new things that you had to do when you were upgrading to Okada, um, creating those records and arranging things in the database to set the stage for that. And so we brought a new um, tool called the Nova Status Command that is intended to give you a, a pre-flight check of um, whether you've done all your homework, basically, from the last release to be able to roll forward to, in this case, Okada smoothly. And that's something that we're looking to do um, on a continual basis every time so that you have this kind of ability to, to run the pre-flight check for the next release against your current deployment to hopefully identify all of the the bumps before you roll forward. And Cells had a lot of those things, so it was the the thing that gave us the need for that, that pre-flight check. Also, cells v2 is, uh, the other thing with cells v1 is you didn't have a lot of the API features, like um, security groups, floating IPs, aggregates. Cells v2 is a feature complete API. Some other highlights from Okada, there were quite a few API improvements. Um, one, one of the big things was the We've had JSON schema validation of the request body, but we didn't have any JSON schema validation of the request parameters. That was added. Um, so we can do micro between different micro versions, we can validate what the actual query parameters are. Another thing was the sort and filter query parameters were just sort of this wild west of, if it's in the data model, you can query for it in 500 year API. Um, so we actually put a white list on that thing. It's, and restricted a lot of the um, like being able to sort by joined tables <clears throat> or things that are in the Oslo database or Oslo DB model that you shouldn't know about and we'll give you a 500 out of the API. And then over time, I think we're going to try to shrink that whitelist down to things that actually make sense. And the simple tenant usage API now supports paging. That was another, it's a sort of a drain when you have to pull in everything um, for simple tenant usage, I think, which Horizon uses as soon as you log in. It's part of the home page. Some other random improvements. Dan already talked about the Nova status upgrade check. Um, that came up yesterday. There was an operators forum session about, like every summit, every, every time everybody gets together, there's a session about upgrades and the pain involved with upgrades. And we pointed out that this is an Okada, which, again, like nobody is at Okada yet. But we're really interested in getting feedback on how, how people think that this actually helps them um, before they start upgrading. And it's also item potent, so you can be running it after, before and after you upgrade to make sure that you got everything right. So you, how do you pull it into Newton so that you can actually run it? How, you just 
you'd run it like from a VN for a separate container or something like that against it. Okay. So that, that way you can okay. you can run yeah. it without having altered your right, right, right. setup. But, yep. but, but it needs some kind of environment, so that's the right way to do it. Right. The question was how do you if you're on Newton, how do you run this code that's in Okada? And the answer is put it in a virtual environment or a container or something. Um, OS Profiler, there's been a patch that's been around for several releases that was never merged. That got merged in Okada. I know people were taking that patch and cherry picking it out of tree so that they could be doing rally and profiling testing um, internally. So that's finally now part of the actual main path. Um, the vendor data v2 metadata API, I believe that was added in Newton. Um, at the Barcelona summit, we identified some gaps in the metadata API and Michael still uh, implemented several basically enhancements to this like um, service user tokens and the ability, operators said that I want the ability to if, um, when I'm booting an instance, if I can't actually communicate with my vendor data, metadata API, I want the build to stop. I don't want it because it could be required for authentication or something. Um, so a lot of that, and it's, it's documented in the spec, has more details on what the actual improvements were. Uh, there were a lot of feature parity improvements to several vert drivers, notably Hyper-V and Ironic got a lot of um, basically just feature parity improvements to match up more with like Zen and Libvert. And I believe Virtuoso has live migration support in Okada. That's why I called them out here. And it's also now possible to use a service token for long running operations between Nova and Neutron and Nova and Cinder. We don't, we're still working on that for Nova and Glance. For example, doing a long running snapshot of a large image, which would, the token would expire during the snapshot. Um, this is disabled by default. There's a config option, you can turn this on, but then you basically provide um, service user credentials and it will re-authenticate with Keystone using this service token if you set it up. Um, OSIC, was, OSIC was working on this and there were plans to do some uh, scale testing and endurance testing with this thing to see how it actually improves long running live migrations or just snapshots or things like that since OSIC is now no more, it would be great for us if anybody, you know, plays around with this and can provide feedback about how this is working for people. <laughs> yeah. No problem, Dave. <laughs> so these, this is a um, slide from the foundation. So for all of you product and project manager types um, in the audience, this is, I guess, where some of the themes that we're working on for the Pike release. I'm not exactly sure what modularity means, but I asked and didn't get an answer. Isn't that the running independent services instead of running all of them? Don't know. We don't know? Maybe. So, good question. Uh, so, we'll go over some of the new features and enhancements that we're working on for Pike. First one is scheduling and placement, which Jay will talk about. So, a um, couple of the, the big pieces that uh, that we're working on in the placement API. Um, we've, we've merged already uh, much of the support for traits, which are the qualitative part of the request. So uh, resource classes are the quantitative part you get, you know, for vCPU and uh, gig of memory or whatever. Uh, the qualitative part of the request, do you want, you know, SSD disk or whatever? Uh, those are what we're calling traits. And uh, you're now able to decorate a resource provider, which is a thing that provides resources, with uh, a set of traits. We've created a, a standardized libra or a library of standardized traits called OS Traits, which people are contributing to, which is very helpful. Um, another, another major piece that we're working on in, in Pike is support for uh, shared, shared resource pools or shared resource providers. The canonical example of this would be a, a shared storage pool, right? Uh, right now, if you <laughs> use an NFS share for your, your instance disk storage, the reporting of, of disk resources is wildly inaccurate. <laughs> Basically, you just multiply the number of compute nodes that are using that shared storage pool and it like blows up the amount of a perceived capacity of, of disk. Um, so shared resource providers are a way of saying, hey, this is a, a, a resource provider that has 
two terabytes or whatever of, of disk space, and it shares that disk space with a set of other resource providers, compute nodes is an, an example, via an aggregate association. So uh, we're, we're, we're currently working through the, the patches for that. Um, the next thing is, is moving the process of allocating resources uh, from the compute node to either the scheduler or the conductor. We're, we're not entirely sure where we're going to put it. Uh, and that's, that's called uh, claims in the scheduler. Um, so Sylvan, uh, I don't know if he's still here, but Sylvan's leading, leading that effort. Uh, this should dramatically reduce the amount of time that scheduler retries um, can, can occur. So that's one of the big, big enhancements there. Um, also trying to get uh, support for nested resource providers. So that's uh, dependent on a number of other things. And uh, that is things like SRIOV VFs and uh, Newman topology, uh, that kind of thing. So, um, and then finally, yeah, uh, testing for uh, performance and scale and resiliency things about the integration between Nova Compute and the placement API as well as Nova Scheduler and the placement API. So, thanks. We're still working on cells, so Dan's going to talk about cells. So, um, in Okada, everybody uh, is on cells v2. Everybody is a cell of one, um, kind of finally making that a, a, a true statement. Um, however, you can't create a second cell and have things work. Uh, and, and that's really just because part of Cells v2 is baking into all the components of Nova the understanding that we, we don't just have one database. You can't just assume that if you go look for an instance, it's in one place. And so um, now that we've merged the kind of core bit in Okada, Pike is you know, going around to all of the different components and making sure that they all get um, enlightened to this fact that um, that we can have things in multiple places and or you know, talk to components via different queues. And, and um, that's a lot of work. <clears throat> it's something that Cells v1 never actually did. And it's why in Cells v1, things like flavors don't work or aggregates or security groups. Um, so that's the, that's the major Cells focus um, for this cycle is teaching all of those components um, about this new arrangement. Um, and then, of course, getting the CI testing that we do in the gate to actually uh, test a multi-cell environment as the standard way all of our jobs run as much as possible. Obviously, with our CI workers, we don't have 1,000 node CI jobs, so it's slightly synthetic. But at least we partition things such that hopefully all the things that need to cross partitions are, are tested and working. Um, and then um, another, another big thing is uh, transitioning the way we, we do our quota usage calculation in Nova. Instead of doing all of this accounting in the database that um, is in sync for at least five minutes until it gets out of sync, um, moving to this, this mode where we kind of count things on the fly. And that works a lot better for us once Things are all in different places where you can't use you know, constraints to make sure that you didn't run out of space and whatever. Um, so ensuring that all of our um, uh, components and APIs are cell aware, making sure that they are hopefully doing the um, higher performance, uh, scalable way of, of you know, striping requests across all of those cells, and then any kind of hardening issues that come up out of the, the developers rolling to Okada and hitting those um, new things they need to add for manageability of the records, creating their cell information, updating it, all, all of this kind of uh, making sure that it all works with multiple cells now that we've got everybody on the core in Pike. And I, I forgot to mention during the Okada piece that we worked quite a bit on. There's documentation in tree for both placement for upgrade impacts and things that have changed in addition to the release notes. And we've also done quite a few um, pages of documentation on upgrading to cells v2 and sort of 
base install scenarios, upgrade scenarios. Um, we're going to need help with sales v1 to sales v2 migration, but I'll solicit requests for help there. And also, we forgot to mention that the placement's getting an API ref, so that's good. Yep. Yeah, we're working on an API reference for placement. There's a question? Yeah, so I wasn't completely clear. Is cells, multiple, multiple cells going to be available for prime time in uh, this cycle, or is that going to go live? In, in, in Pike, you will be able to create a second cell and expect it to work. Um, it will be a, um, a release where people that are currently running cells v1 are probably not going to be able to replace, the, you know, replace their deployment with a multi-cell cells v2 purely from a hitting all of the performance, uh, you know, uh, make, making sure that all the components are high performant in a multi-cell environment. But it's it's going to be enough for you to run pre-prod that way and help us find Test. correctness issues, scale issues, that kind of thing. Right. And the status check tool you introduced in Okada will also be in Pike to see if you're ready for Pike. Mm -hmm. Yep. The question was about the status upgrade tools. Yeah, we plan on basically doing currency on that tool for every release. So there are certain things, um, like the control plane makes decisions based on the compute, the minimum compute service version in your deployment. So we're doing some things where we, you know, like require a minimum newer compute version. So like if you're running Pike with kilo computes, <laughs> you're gonna get some. You're gonna, fail. You're gonna get some red yeah. flood flags from that thing. Uh, another big effort that's work, that's um, sort of finally making some traction in Pike with actual code is um, related to vault, volume multi-attach. The Cinder team provided a set of APIs in Okada in a micro version 3.27 that um, Nova is going to be leveraging in Pike to try to abstract a lot. There's, there's still a lot of legacy, tightly coupled code between Nova and Cinder from when Cinder was Nova volume. And we've been talking about multi-attach since the serious time. <laughs> yeah, since seriously, like at least Mataka. And we probably burned at least one or two releases of how do we shoehorn volume multi-attach into the existing technical debt that we have, and we just realized this is not going to be maintainable, and it's just sort of a, a terrible fit. So we've been working at, like, it's, it's been at least a year. We have weekly meetings between the Nova and Cinder team um, to be defining these new APIs and how we can put a lot of so that Nova doesn't have to be um, maintaining data that Cinder actually should be the source of truth on. So things like connection information and connector off the compute and stuff like that. So. Cinder has this new uh, attachments API that Nova is going to be using uh, to try to clean up a lot of this flow between all of the different, like swap volume and migrations and just the normal attach flow. And we're working on that in Pike. Question? So you several times uh, said you're going to need operator help. Do, do you guys have good use cases that you understand what operators want to be doing with this? Is that already understood, or do they need to be participating that weekly? For multi-attach? So we're not, so for this one, we're not too multi-attached yet. Okay. This is really that, well, the original implementation proposed for multi-attach so in this, Nova. This is rebuilding the current thing so that you right. can rebuild it. Okay. Yeah. It's because Nova was going to have to have a ton of conditionals of is this a multi-attached type thing, and it was going to be really ugly. But you do have participation from the people that are interested in actually using multi-attach. Right, I mean like... Yeah, Oracle, Oracle, there, Oracle has contributed a developer that's really been helping out with keeping the patches moving and we're trying to move a lot of it. We're, we're working it really back. We decided at the PTG that the way we're going to work on this is um, sort of backward. So we start with supporting detach and then nothing really ever turns on until you start doing attach in the new flow because everything is keyed off the way that you attach the volume in the first place. This is all supported through rolling upgrades because we're using microversions and service versions to checks. Um, oh, and then for Grenade, we can do upgrade testing. So you can attach a volume the old way on the Okada side, roll it through to Pike, and then detach it and make sure that it doesn't explode. We do need some help. Like, nobody's actually, there are some gaps in Grenade that we need help with, but they're at least known, <laughs> known issues. Um, some other improvements are that we're working on for Pike. Uh, there are a couple specs that actually um, OSIC owned but now are in need of an owner, I think, 
Kenichi might be working on these now, but um, well, you are now that it's recorded. Um, <laughs> there, there are a couple API improvements for uh, li controlling live migration timeouts. Um, another one that had been around for a couple of releases, this is actually a very, I don't know how many duplicate bugs we've gotten for the second one, but um, we used to never do validation of projects with the flavor and quota management APIs. So when you add flavor access or you um, update quota, to quota values for a given project, we never validated that project actually existed in Keystone. So it wouldn't fail, it just didn't do what you wanted it to do and we would just get a ton of duplicate bugs about that. So that's actually now fixed in Pike. Um, we're deprecating more, we, we deprecated some old um, proxy APIs in Newton and things related to Nova Network. We're continuing, like, there's a lot of API code in Nova and we just sort of find new things all the time. So we're still going through and like cleaning house on old things that aren't used. This is really about reduction of technical debt and complexity. Um, something else that's been asked for for a while is uh, embedding the actual instance. We, we've always stored the flavor that you use to boot an instance, but what you might get out of the API for that flavor a year later could be different from what you actually created the instance with. So this is a, this is a thing where instead of just giving you the flavor ID, which might be totally different, we're actually gonna embed the flavor um, in, in the server response body that was used to create the instance. Another thing is specifying tags when creating a server. You can, you've been able to apply tags to a server that's already created for a while, but this is actually applying tags when creating a server. It's a pretty simple, um, it's not a simple change to make, but it's a logical uh, continuation. And then another thing that came up was, I think this actually came up in the Tokyo Summit. Um, Cinder added the support for extending the size of an attached volume, well, extending the size of a volume, but Nova never supported the ability to extend that attached volume while it's attached to an instance. So uh, that's being worked on now. So Cinder will actually call out to Nova and let, let us know that, hey, this thing's been extended, you need to go down to the compute and um, toggle the guest. Another, another big one is, um, this may seem small, but it sort of has come up over time about manageability, but uh, sort of like the config option cleanup that's been going on for quite a while. It's, it's not like sexy or anything, but very useful is, and OSIC was running this too, but actually documenting the policy. So pointing out for this policy rule, this is the API that uses it, sort of a short description of how this is, what this actually means, because if you just look at the policy JSON file, it's not clear at all. Like, you basically have to go into the code to figure out if I'm gonna tweak this policy rule, what might I be breaking? And you have to go look at the code. This is really for operators to just not have to dig into code, really. Um, so I was asked to talk about maybe some things that we're gonna be working on for Queens. Um, there was a spec for supporting resource tracking and scheduling of uh, virtual GPUs that didn't quite make Pike, but I think we're gonna be um, putting an effort into getting that cleaned up and we just actually had a session this morning talking about this. Um, we really need operate, there's a, there is a spec, we need operator input, um, comments just, or thumbs up that yes, this, this is something I need and uh, please move forward with it. Uh, as Jay talked about, support for full shared storage and network reporting and then um, affinity support in the placement API. So server group affinity, anti-affinity, that's sort of this weird it's something Dan didn't go into, but there's something we've been talking about, which is up calls. We want to we want to stop doing up calls from the compute service up to the control plane, especially when you start getting into cells, different cells v2 deployment topology. And today, because of the the way that the server affinity and affinity group stuff works, there is this like last check on the compute node that calls way back up into the API database to say, is everything actually okay? Because if it's not, I need to fail. And it's also constantly passing um, updates between the computes, all of the computes, to the scheduler to make sure that the filter is making the right decision. We would really love to just get, right, kill all that stuff, put it in placement, and let, since placement is external to the deployment, um, help us make the right decisions when we actually do scheduling. Um, another thing that's been coming up is uh, access policy improvements. So 
the, John Garbutt has a spec about this, and there's a couple other sessions this week about um, fixing some of the policy issues and, and RBAC. One of them would be how do you determine uh, the global God state admin, basically, and then like a project specific admin. This is sort of like the dedicated hosting case. Um, and there's, there's just some like legacy, um, I guess, warts in Nova where even if you specify your policy to say um, non admins can do this action, there's actually hard coded code down in the database API that says, like, I don't care what your policy says, I'm not going to let you if you're not an admin. This also affects how um, service user, like locking of an instance. So exam for example, Trove locking an instance. Um, if it doesn't actually own it, but the service user should be able to lock it. We have to fix up a lot of the policy work for this. Um, if we don't, I don't think, I, I mean, I will be honest, I don't think we're going to get to multi-attach in Pike because of the amount of work that has to be done to actually upgrade all of this code to use the new Cinder APIs in, um, in Pike. But I think if we get that done, which will be a pretty major accomplishment um, for like, the end user will have no idea that we did all of this, but that will set the stage for finally actually supporting multi-attach and testing it out in Queens. Um, another thing that we had a session about yesterday was this idea of using Cinder as an ephemeral storage backend. So operators saying, I don't ever want you using local disk for anything. I want to use, I have Cinder and I've got a bunch of storage that I bought. I want to use that for everything. Um, I think we're going to have a spec coming out of this. There were a few different options yesterday we talked about. There's very short term things that we can do, which maybe are hackier. And then there's the very long term, more complicated things that we want to do, but don't really have owners to drive those things. So we're going to have to make some decisions about what we're going to do there. Um, Integration of limits in Keystone is going to be something we're going to look at for Queens. In the Pike release, there is now a spec and a concept of, instead of all of the different projects like Nova Cinder storing quota limit information, actually storing that in Keystone, where project hierarchy is stored, and eventually moving towards all the usage information would still be calculated in the projects, but like let's do limits the same at least. So we're, it's really um, Sean Dagg trying to start with something that we can at least all agree on because we've been talking about hierarchy um, or hierarchical quota support for a long time. And it generally gets bogged down in implementation, like, implementation details. details and project specific, um, just different ways of doing things. And it, we really just sort of want to start small because this is a massive change for every project really that's doing anything with quotas. And then cells be too hardening, which is going to be, I think, mainly performance and manageability improvements, like, like Dan was saying. And then including, right now, you can only migrate instances within a cell. We would try to look at being able to actually migrate instances across cells in Queens. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, we do need help. And some of this is just giving us feedback, answering questions. These are The questions are mainly when the User survey committee asks the PTLs for, you know, you get one question to ask in the user survey. Generally, it's We're much for. Right. It's much easier. It's also much easier if you ask a question that can be quantitative or multiple choice instead of what don't you like about Nova, you know, because that's everything. Right. Right. You're not going to get a great answer for that. Um, but things I've personally been very interested in is are your using user are your users using microversions? Anything beyond 2.1. Um, they've been around a while, but people are just, you know, most deployments are on Mataka, starting to roll to Newton. Like, and if operators are keeping track even of usage, like this would, if anybody is mining data on this, like, please provide feedback because it'd be good to know. Because um, I think we're up to like 2.50 something now in Pike. Like, we are doing quite a few microversions each release. Um, another good feedback item was would be, have you started evaluating or testing the placement service? It was optional in Newton. It's required in Okada. I know people aren't really at Okada yet. But if people can be kicking the tires on any of this stuff in like a Newton pre-prod sandbox or something, you know, give us feedback. Same thing with v 2 Have you started evaluating any of that stuff? Uh, again, same case. It's optional in Newton, but it, there is code available that you can start kicking this around. And another thing that's been getting worked on for several releases is um, adding support for version notifications. 
So we've always had notifications, but they were never versions. So we were always, you could maybe add things to the notification payload, but you couldn't remove things. It was just it's sort of the same thing with micro versions. You need to have versions so that the consumer can um, know what's coming in and be able to handle it. However, I really don't know who's, I asked this the other day in one of the operator sessions, and I don't know who's really using notifications in general or how they're using them, um, or if anybody's even using version notifications. I'm also interested in performance impacts of, of doing it, because are we needlessly generating load in Nova just to emit something that nobody's actually consuming? A developer request we already touched on, we need performance profiling and scale testing. OSIC had large labs to do scale testing and load testing. We don't have those anymore. I don't have a 1,000 nodes in my basement. You don't? No. Mine's in the shop. OK. <laughs> Sorry. New tires. Um, so if people are doing, I know people are running Rally and Profiler like on maybe 400 nodes somewhere in, in pre-prod. If, if people can be sharing with us, like, I don't know what you changed. Like, it, it doesn't need to be super specific, but it's like, I don't know what you changed between February and March, but all of a sudden, it takes, I don't know, 30 more seconds to boot a server or something like that. Like, that would be very valuable data to us so that we can dig into this kind of stuff because we don't have scale testing in the gate. Um, and then the, we also need operators that are running cells v1. We called this out in the cells v2 session the other day. Um, but we, and I think GoDaddy and CERN said that they would be helping us out. Yeah, and I think they're still CERN. door in the large deployment. <coughs> well, I see. I recognize some faces, so I know some of them are here. But this is really about, we don't have, we don't have like grenade testing for cells v1 in the gate. That grenade is the upgrade um, framework. We are gonna need help with people that have cells v1 deployments helping us with the migration path to cells v2. And the validation that v2 is, knowing when v2 is a suitable replacement, it's gonna be something that, you know, someone with a large deployment has to tell yep. us. So I put in here a bunch of, these are actually all sessions that come after this one. So these are all sessions that are related to um, stuff we've talked about. So if you're interested in any of the stuff that we've already talked about, you know, come to these other sessions later in the week. Some of them are later today, and some of them are just presentations. So we've only got a couple minutes left, so you have a lot of questions. Yeah. So Jay's giving talks on placement and resource scheduling. Dan has a talk this afternoon on cells v2. Here's a few more. If anybody has questions, I use the mic would be great, but if, if you just want to shout it out, we can repeat it. Go back three slides, four slides now. One more. All right, so uh, use Cinder as an ephemeral storage backend. Then we've got plenty of examples of existing SEP as ephemeral storage already. Will there be an upgrade plan, or do you need help with uh, people that are already using SEP as ephemeral if they want to go to this? So the question is, we already have SEP as ephemeral. So this is really... This is, yeah, the, the idea with this is you create a new image backend that is Cinder. It's a proxy to Cinder. Right, right, right. My question is, or do you need a migration strategy? Do you need to create tools? Do you need us to create tools? That doesn't exist. Right, right, right. 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 We need a warm body to actually, that knows how to write code to create this thing. That's where, it, so yesterday the big thing was, this is the utopia we would want because it would replace the Ceph driver, the scale IO driver, and it would add support for 70 other vendor drivers in Cinder. We really want that thing, but with nobody actually driving it or owning it, it's, you know, who knows what's gonna happen. Um, so yes, definitely. Conversion was what I was curious yeah, about. Right. Any other questions? Two minutes left. No? All right, if not, oh. Uh, I've, just, uh, I've just asked uh, the Neutron guys, and I will ask you. Uh, there is a problem when we have two physical networks on different hosts, and there is no interaction between Neutron and Nova, and they actually slightly pointed to you. It says, right, field, uh, schedulers. We have one network available on host A, one network available on host B. When we schedule uh, some instance to running on network A, and Nova schedule says, oh, I want host B, and there is no <laughs> way to take this in account. Right. As far as I hear, there is the same thing with Cinder, but 
it's not my topic. Do you have some kind of inter-project scheduler interaction? Because I think that if something is not available, there is no reason to schedule there. There's going to be no right. valid cost found uh, error. Do you want me to answer, you want to answer that? Um, well, I mean, the, the general answer is that there, there is a, a series of work that is currently being worked on that adds um, network and switch, network group and switch tags to the port binding profile um, so that when, when you do a Nova boot and you pass in dash dash nick port ID equal blah blah blah, it will uh, build a PCI device, a set of PCI device requests. In that PCI device request will contain the network group and switch group from the port binding profile. We'll use that to match against information that we have on the compute hosts. Um, I'm not saying it's done now, but um, I can't remember who is. Um, but this will also only, only will solve the problem when it gets to IOC. It, it, that's it, correct. It's um, talking about the more general. Yeah, I was, Carl Baldwin had the spec on rather neutron ne routed networks. Rather network stuff, And being yeah. able to use placement for aggregates tied to um, network pools. It's the shared storage pool, but for network problem. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so only migrate within a given aggregate. But no interaction. There is no plans for Nova it, asking the drone before. It's Nova, Nova would be asking placement. Everything feeds all of their information into placement, and then Nova asks placement. Neutron would be feeding into placement. I have these oh. two separate pools of things, and so when you assign one, you know which one you got. Right. And only migrate within that thing. Don't send it somewhere else where it's not going to get networking anymore. Yeah. Yep. And there, was, there is a sort of overhaul, too, that's part of that that's been worked on for a while, which is network aware scheduling and moving some of that cruft out of the compute service and into the conductor service. But OSIC was driving it, and it needs love, basically. So any other questions? No? Nope. I think we're there's at. Right. The question. Right. The question was: Will placement and the scheduler stay within Nova? Placement is going to be split out. That it's been written as a. It's a separate service and it's a separate endpoint. It's been written as a completely separate thing that we can just lift out. Um, Nova scheduler will stay in Nova. So this isn't like Gantt, if you're familiar with Gantt from a few years ago. Um, and Chris Dent has been looking at what, sort of looking at what it would look like when we pulled it placement service out and what is going to be needed there. But placement is its own entry in the service catalog and can be used externally right. by other things already. All of the Nova services thing. talk to placement as though it's already external. Right. There, there's, uh, there's even separate, separate um, REST APIs. packages as yep. well yep. For, for it. The, the single issue right now is that it, it does use the top level API database in Nova. So that's um, just config wise. Right. But yeah, the, the plan is to have placement split out. And the second question. Uh, uh, historically, Nova supported automatic network uh, usage if you have one network. There is actually hard-coded. If we have one network, we know, we know what to do. If user didn't supply uh, network, you eat. Uh, but the prob problem is that if we have many networks, and we want some logic to choose one of them on operator's side uh, without forcing uh, this uh, um, process of choosing proper network on users. Is any kind of mechanism where we can describe if users come and ask, for instance, use this network, we operators know he should go there. Because the problem is if users have configuration file with hard-coded network name or hard-coded UID, and we change anything in installation, every automation, user automation fails. Right. If they move to a different region, the same problem, UEs are different and none is working. Is there any kind of outer selection mechanism? Do you have any plans for this? There is, so there is, Armando, the old Neutron PTL, has a session this afternoon about get me a network enhancements. So if you are unfamiliar with. Yes, but the, the main problem 
are somehow compatible with existing tools around OpenStack. Because people know two ways to specify a network, by name and by UID, and that's all. And any kind of additional tools, they will not appear in sure, the ground like this, out of nowhere. This isn't a separate tool. I this think what you're asking for is maybe tagging a network as, you know, of these four options, this one is the one. By default, take this one. Yes, yes. I would bring that up in the Get Me a Network discussion this afternoon with Armando, because it's really about enhancing this experience. User experience. Right. And I, both of us did a session yesterday about Get Me a Network, so if you want more information on that, it's already posted. But it's, it's definitely not a separate component. I mean, it's, it's interaction yeah. between Nova and Neutron. But I know what you're saying. Today, if, if you don't specify and you have more than one, you get a, it fails. Right. Yep. Anything else? No? Thanks, everybody. Thank you.